Hi, everyone. We are thrilled to have Glass Health as our sponsor. Let's hear from Dr. Derek Paul, the co-founder and CEO of Glass Health, which is a platform for medical knowledge management and AI-assisted diagnosis. I would hear a noon conference or a lecture on a topic, um, and I might write it down, write some notes on a piece of paper or uh, put it in my notes app. And then, you know, six months later, I'm facing the same topic and I, I feel like I don't know this information. And I feel like I'm starting from zero again. And I, I, wa- I wanted to have a single place where I was creating a concept in my mind and then building on that concept over time. And so uh, when I talk to folks who are using the notebook really regularly, that's what's happening for them is they feel like they are uh, really building out a level of expertise that helps them when they come to take care of a patient, bring their whole education and their whole, uh, all the work that they've done uh, in learning to that case. I think that's really, really exciting. Yes, so great. So you can click on the link in the show notes to learn more about Glass. There's a free version as well as a Glass Pro version where you get unlimited AI queries. Good news, you can get one month free access to Glass Pro using the promo code CORE-IM. We'll link it in our show notes. And with that, let's get on to the episode. Welcome to the Five Pearls Podcast, bringing you high-yield, evidence-based pearls. Today is part two of radiation oncology, diving into side effects and maybe busting some myths along the way. Joining me today is Dr. Sam Kumarsana. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sam, a second-year resident at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Really looking forward to our second part of this deep dive, Radonk 2, Electric Boogaloo. (laughs) <laughs> um, can you explain what that cultural reference is if there's anyone like me who did not understand that the first time? Yeah, I think there's this old movie called Break in Two, where it was a cult classic, really bad, so bad it's good, and then they released a sequel and they ended it Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> okay. I just thought we'd check that I, Again, I learned so much good cultural references through making these episodes. Everyone, if you haven't already, go ahead and, and listen to part one. It's a really good foundation for radiation oncology. And also look out for a short YouTube whiteboard animation that Sam created that really goes over some interesting physiology on radiation that's a bit outside the scope for this episode. And with that, let's get started on the pearls we'll be covering today. Quiz yourself. Remember, the more you test yourself, the deeper your learning gains. Pearl one, systemic radiation effects. To what extent does radiation affect fatigue, cytopenias, and immunosuppression? Pearl 2, lung radiation side effects. What are the short-term and long-term side effects we see with radiation to the lung? Pearl 3, breast radiation side effects. What are the short-term and long-term side effects we can see with radiation to the breast? Pearl 4, Prostate radiation side effects. What are the short and long-term side effects we can see with radiation to the prostate? And wrapping it up with Pearl 5, brain radiation side effects. What are the short and long-term side effects that we can see from radiation to the brain? Okay, I'm really excited for this episode because I think a lot of us will be seeing a patient uh, who had prior radiation and asking ourselves, hmm, is that symptom that the person's feeling an adverse effect of radiation or something else? So maybe we can start big picture and think about the more generalizable symptoms, right? And I think the biggest generalized symptoms that our patients often feel is fatigue. Yeah, that's a good one. I I'm wondering, why do patients get fatigued after radiation anyway? The fatigue associated with radiation, it's actually poorly understood exactly why patients feel tired. The thought is that there is a cytokine storm or cytokine release, which may be triggering kind of a subclinical inflammatory, systemic inflammatory process that may be contributing. That's Dr. Matt Abrams, a radiation oncologist at BIDMC. Yep, and when in doubt, it's those cytokine storms always causing havoc. Yep, those darn cytokine storms. 
fatigue or tiredness, that can take the longest to get to get better. I definitely have patients that I've treated uh, that still have persistent fatigue sometimes six to 12 months later. Um, and it is highly variable, once again, from patient to patient, the area that you're treating. The fatigue for most people tends to start around halfway through their radiation course. And then it kind of gets a little bit worse and worse as we go through things, sort of peaking towards the end of the radiation because it's a cumulative effect. I often counsel patients that however long you are on treatment for might be how long it might take you to feel close to back to your baseline. So if you were on treatment for four weeks or six weeks, it's not that you won't get better during the four or six weeks after treatment, but um, it might take those four or six weeks after treatment's done for you to really feel, you know, a noticeable improvement. That was a super helpful rule of thumb from Dr. Spiegel, an assistant professor in radiation oncology at Harvard Medical School. She specializes in breast and gyne malignancies at BIDMC. Let's recap that. However long your patient's radiation course lasted is going to be generally how long it takes for them to feel closer to their baseline. Mm, That is helpful. Okay, so that's fatigue. Let's talk about another general side effect that often comes up, cytopenias. I think we've all seen patients that get admitted for an unrelated reason. Their blood work comes back. It shows some cytopenias. And of course, radiation gets put on the differential. Is that the right way to think about it? There's also this temporal relationship as well. During treatment, we often see these kind of cytopenias, but like years down the road, would we still see them? Uh, That's harder to know. Um, You can definitely see kind of bone marrow changes on CT and MRI after treatment, but whether that has any lasting effect uh, that could still cause cytopenias down the road is much less clear. So, you know, the bone marrow can regenerate itself, right? So when we're giving radiation, it's not a myeloablative radiation. I'd be very careful about hanging your hat on cytopenias years down the road on prior radiation. I would almost use it as a diagnosis of exclusion to make sure that you, you know, are thinking about other things, other more serious things like MDS. Speaking of MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome, we should be aware that secondary MDS or even acute myeloid leukemia AML are small but very real risks after radiation exposure. And particularly with MDS, it's been cited that about 20% of all MDS cases are secondary to either radiation or chemo. And just like we talked about, the timing is really critical here. Because sure, during treatment, you can see cytopenias with radiation or chemo. But say you have a cytopenia after radiation years down the line, secondary MDS or potentially a leukemia are absolutely on the differential. Now with that, let's get back to cytopenias in general. Maybe thinking about when we are at highest risk for seeing cytopenias. And the highest risk of cytopenia probably depends on how much radiation a patient got or the site of the radiation. The more bone marrow you radiate, the higher the risk of causing a cytopenia. So once again, if I'm treating, I don't know, a humeral net, you know, am I going to expect a cytopenia? No. If I'm treating their entire spine with cranial spinal irradiation, could I see some cytopenias? Yeah, I definitely could. Would I prophylax them with Bactrim for PCP? Maybe. (laughs) I don't know. Sure. Kind of depends. Okay, got it. We'll think of places with lots of bone marrow, like radiation to the spine, bowel, prostate, GYN tumors. All of these are probably high risk. But it also probably kind of depends, right? Yeah, so it really does depend, right? It, it reminds me of the, one of my big pet peeves. I often hear uh, people like throw around on rounds, oh, that patient got radiation, they must be immunocompromised. And this bugs me so much because I don't know if lumping everybody with a history of radiation under the same immunocompromised bucket is right. My gut is that that's not accurate, but I'm curious how the radonks think about radiation-induced immunocompromise. Yeah, so our radonks said, once again, it kind of comes down to the amount of radiation the patient receives and how much of that bone marrow is actually getting radiated. And then on top of that, you had chemo in the mix, which really muddies the waters on how immunocompromised they might be. For most patients, it is not going to be the radiation itself that is going to be causing uh, the cytopenias or the immune suppression. More often, it's caused by the chemotherapy that's given concurrently with radiation. But there might be some added component of um, 
immune suppression or cytopenia from the radiation, but the majority is from, you know, the chemotherapy that they're getting. If you're talking about treating a rectal cancer, again, often giving that with concurrent chemotherapy, uh, and it's really the chemotherapy that tends to be the culprit rather than the radiation. So that's a really great point. Usually the immunosuppression is from the chemo, but if there is radiation to an area with a lot of bone marrow, it could definitely add to the immunosuppression. And with chemo radiation on top of it, it's going to be pretty synergistic, right? It's not a two plus two equals four kind of thing. It's going to be more than that. I think one thing that really surprised me was that radiation can also activate the immune system too. It's pretty weird. On the other end, we actually see when we radiate, sometimes we actually see immune responses in patients who are getting immune therapy to other sites of disease. That's called the abscopal effect. So once again, it's it's really unknown. So you can actually see augmented immune responses after radiation sometimes. So who knows? (laughs) Wait, what? What's this abscopal effect? I think the basic idea is that radiation is going to cause tumor cells to break down and release their contents, right? And then the immune system gets activated against the tumor and then attacks the tumor throughout the body. So effectively, what you see is that you give radiation to one site and then you see all the tumors throughout the body shrinking. Super rare, but it's a neat concept. Oh my gosh. Now I just feel like it's a it's a toss-up. Radiation can suppress the immune system or activate it or maybe not affect it much at all. And I guess we really can't lump everyone under the same immunocompromised bucket. So I'm curious, are there any objective measures other than cytopenias uh, that we can tell if someone's more immunocompromised than, than others? I counsel all my patients on this is even if we treat you with radiation and there's no um, objective way to measure your immunocompromised status, as in we do blood work and we don't see any significant cytopenias. I think we know that the immune system, that person's immune system is not at the same level as the average person. Um, and sometimes that's almost like an intangible amount. When I see patients in clinic, my first question during consult is, how many COVID boosters have you gotten and when's your next one? Um, and when's your flu shot? You should get it. That being said, I think in general, after treatment, the risk of quote, quote unquote immunocompromised status is much, much lower. Um, I don't classically consider anyone immunocompromised after generally we radiate them. Um, but once again, it kind of depends on each particular situation. Okay. I guess as much as we wanted a real concrete answer about immunocompromise, it's just as Dr. Abram said, it's often an intangible amount. But I do think we can breathe a bit easier about someone's immunocompromised status and think a bit more precisely about it if the radiation has already been done and if there was no concurrent chemo involved. Absolutely. Maybe let's pause here to summarize these big three generalized potential side effects of radiation. The big one we first talked about is fatigue, which again is super variable, but we have this helpful rule of thumb. After the radiation's done, it might take roughly the duration of that radiation course for your patient to feel more like themselves. With cytopenias, if you're radiating an area with a lot of bone marrow, like the pelvis or the spine, you might see low counts, but you really should only be seeing them during the time your patient's getting radiated. Otherwise, you're pretty much in the clear. And after the radiation is done, let's remember that it's unlikely to be the culprit for cytopenias, so we should really be keeping our differentials wide open. And the same thing really goes for immunosuppression. You really should only see it during radiation. I think one reassuring thing is that the radiation oncologists really do follow up with their patients frequently and can help us triage some of these side effects. I always counsel patients, you know, we see our patients weekly and and often, you know, very, very frequently in follow-up as well. It's not like they're going to develop side effect and we're sending them out in a boat in the middle of the ocean. Radiation oncologists, uh, you know, uh, see patients for decades after treatment. So we're often the ones following them um, afterwards, both from a cancer surveillance standpoint, but also a uh, toxicity reevaluation standpoint as well. As uh, I was always taught, we're oncologists first. Uh, we just happen to use uh, radiation as our drug of choice. Yep. Radongs are oncologists first by training. They don't just do radiation, but they are great colleagues to partner with as issues arise for these patients. Okay, now that we talked about general side effects, now let's get a bit more into specific complications that arise. 
The main thing to remember is side effects really only happen in the location where we're aiming the radiation. So if I treated this patient for a brain tumor, but later on they experience a small bowel obstruction, even though that could be an unusual complication from radiation aimed at the bowel, it has nothing to do with the fact that I treated their brain tumor with radiation. Um, and while that might be a, a more extreme example because these two areas are very far from one another, I think sometimes it's interesting to see what gets attributed to radiation. I think we have to remember that radiation is location-specific, so its side effects will also be location-specific. And since radiation is location-dependent, let's focus on the main sites of radiation. So I think the big three being lung, breast, and prostate, and just for kicks, we'll also get into some brain radiation at the end. We'll then divide our side effects for each of these sites into acute and chronic. And I think a lot of us learned in med school that there are these acute side effects, which generally happen during or shortly after the treatment on the order of weeks to months after. And then there are the late side effects, which happen more like years to decades down the road. Yeah, that would be good to go over. I forgot all of it. (laughs) So (laughs) why don't we start off with the lung? So even if you're treating the lung tissue, um, if you have to treat lymph nodes or you're treating a lesion that's close to the middle of the chest, the esophagus can get irritated from the radiation and that can cause patients to sometimes feel like they either have something, they kind of feel like there's something in their chest or have some pain when they're swallowing or feel like they can't get food to go down the right way. Um, That's temporary. It does get better with time. Great. I love telling patients that when things like radiation esophagitis is going to get better with time. And that esophagitis in the acute period reminds me that we can think short-term radiation effects are words that end with itis. Think of like dermatitis, esophagitis, or pneumonitis. And we think of these itis effects as acute because that inflammation comes from the direct effect of the radiation, right? But on the other hand, with the longer-term side effects, we think of the ossuses, such as skin or pulmonary fibrosis. Key point. Itis in the short term, osis in the long term. Yeah, I love that framework of thinking of itis as acute and osis as long term. And I think in addition to radiation esophagitis, the other one we usually hear about with the lung is radiation pneumonitis. But for me, that timeline is pretty fuzzy of when that happens. Irritation of the lung from radiation is called radiation pneumonitis. Uh, usually presents, I'd say, about 6 to 12 months actually after radiation finishes, but it can happen at any point in time. One of our reviewers pointed out that at the earliest, you'll see pneumonitis six weeks after the radiation, not usually during. Then after 12 months, the risk of pneumonitis goes down and the risk of fibrosis goes up. But let's keep in mind, as Dr. Abrams pointed out, pneumonitis can really happen at any point. I think the other thing, teasing apart radiation pneumonitis can just be hard in a patient with fever, cough, and shortness of breath, just from the fact that because they've had radiation, their chest imaging will have some sort of changes. That's a great point. It can be really hard to interpret, especially since we're not going to know if the area of the infiltrate we're seeing is in the same exact distribution of where the radiation went in their chest. Yeah. And thankfully, at the end of the day, this is a clinical diagnosis and we can always ask our pulmonologist or radiation oncologist, whoever's taking ownership of it in the hospital, to help kind of um, assess that out a bit more. I tell patients, you know, anytime that we might treat your breast cancer or lung cancer, if you develop, you know, symptoms that could be consistent with radiation pneumonitis, we first have to make sure that it's not something else because common things being common, it's going to be a regular respiratory illness that's causing your shortness of breath and low grade fever rather than the radiation. But if you're not getting better with all of the normal things, then we can think about, you know, whether or not it might be related to radiation. Okay. Moral of the story, radiation-associated effects are generally diagnoses of exclusion. So by all means, we can put these things on our differentials, but our initial workup shouldn't really differ, whether our patients have gotten radiation or not. Yeah, and I think this brings us back to what we learned in part one, right, where we think about the different types of radiation. And if we had a patient who had a handful of SBRT to a solitary lung nodule, then their fever and cough is pretty unlikely to be symptomatic radiation pneumonitis and it's probably something else. Wow, that's a fantastic throwback. Ah, thanks, yeah. Let's summarize this pearl real quick. I think the most important point here is that radiation-associated side effects are diagnoses of exclusion, especially with radiation pneumonitis. Your patient with cough and fever who got radiation a few weeks ago should still undergo the same pneumonia workup as every other patient. And as a heads up, they're probably going to have post-radiation changes on their imaging, 
which are going to be hard to interpret. Let's move on now to breast radiation. So I'm thinking breast radiation is in the similar distribution as lung radiation. So side effects are the same too? Not quite, actually. Because breast radiation is targeted more superficially, the side effects are also going to be more superficial than what we saw with lung radiation. Sometimes the breast can look a little bit smaller because that scar tissue causes the breast to actually contract a little bit. Um, sometimes there could be some persistent swelling, so the breast might actually look a little bit bigger, not smaller. And what I tell patients is, even though there might be these slight changes, they're usually only something that you or a partner would notice. They are not big enough changes that anybody else would notice when you're wearing a bra and a top and kind of going on about your day. Um, those kinds of you know big changes are, are exceedingly rare. Okay, sounds like breast radiation side effects are more on the surface and hammers home another big takeaway that radiation is not just location dependent, but depth dependent. For breast cancer, the unique situation in the breast is that the breast tissue goes all the way up to the skin surface, as, for the, as opposed to the prostate, which is much deeper seated inside the pelvis. So what's different with breast uh, radiation is that you often see a skin reaction that you do not see with prostate radiation or you don't normally see with prostate radiation. So if I treat a breast cancer, you know, you could definitely see a skin reaction. But when I'm treating pancreatic cancer, I've, I've never seen a patient with a skin reaction or a burn. So for patients with deeper visceral tumors, we can tell them that they're probably not going to have dermatitis. I love that. That's such a good point. Now that I think about it, I don't think I've ever seen a pancreatic cancer patient with dermatitis. Yeah, same. And just reflecting on that, some of the side effects that we talk about here are exceedingly rare, but questions and anxiety about them are super common. And we can help with that. We can help address some of those fears and reassure people. Yeah, no, definitely. And I feel much more empowered to do that after this episode. So let's loop back to breast cancer. We talked about dermatitis as a short-term side effect. What about the long-term side effects here? long-term things that live near the breast are things like the heart and the lungs and the lymph nodes. And so long-term risks have to do with things like developing um, pneumonitis or um, lymphedema or, you know, and this is very rare these days, but radiation-induced cardiac toxicities. But those are pretty rare with our modern radiation techniques. So possible, but really unusual. So I think our takeaway again here is the depth dependence of breast radiation. The deeper structures like the heart and the lung are generally spared in breast radiation, unlike with lung radiation. So Sam, why don't we summarize here? Yeah, I think my takeaways from breast radiation side effects is that I can counsel my patients to expect a sunburn-like dermatitis or other skin changes. And I will keep symptomatic pneumonitis and cardiotoxicity in mind, but I'll also remember that these are thankfully both very rare with modern radiation techniques. And the second to last, let's move on to prostate radiation. What are the acute side effects? We already kind of mentioned that people aren't really going to see burns with it, so I guess that's one win. Yep. A lot of the side effects that you can experience have to do with what's nearby. And so for a prostate patient, I might say you might find you're going to the bathroom more frequently, urinating more frequently, sometimes even having more frequent bowel movements or looser stools, um, things like that. We're back on that location dependence theme here. The acute side effects are going to involve what's nearby the prostate, the bladder, the rectum, basically anything in the pelvis. Now, how about those late side effects? Late side effects, uh, so things like um, uh, erectile dysfunction uh, is a ongoing issue that uh, can happen after any um, uh, treatment to the prostate, whether that be surgery or radiation. Sometimes patients uh, present with uh, rectal bleeding, and that can be associated with a late complication from, from radiation to the prostate. And suffice it to say that if uh, a patient showed up with prior prostate radiation in your clinic with rectal bleeding, you would absolutely want to work up that rectal bleeding for any other reason. I would not um, write it off as related to radiation. Uh, that would be almost a diagnosis of exclusion. You would want to rule that up for work that up for for you know as you normally would, um, whether that be uh, you know a rectal exam, colonoscopy, et cetera, uh, to make sure you're not missing any other underlying malignancy, for example. Aye, aye, Captain. The diagnosis of exclusion is hammered home yet again. But wait a minute. Bones are in the pelvis too. So how does prostate and pelvic radiation affect the bones? Anytime we irradiate the pelvis, there's always the possibility um, long-term that that could cause issues with the 
fracture. Really, that's true for any bone, but we think about it a lot because obviously, you know, you have really important bones that live in your pelvis. Uh, and so, you know, we think about that and counsel patients that they may be more likely to develop a hip fracture down the road if they've gotten a lot of radiation in this area. And as a little aside here, I looked into it to see if there's anything to prevent some of these pelvic fractures. And unfortunately, our interventions, things like calcium, vitamin D supplements, or even bisphosphonates, nothing's really been shown to be effective in preventing these fractures. Yeah, bummer. It's surprising even bisphosphonates aren't, but it's good to know. So let me try to summarize prostate radiation side effects, big picture one. So because radiation is often deeper, we're going to see collateral damage to nearby organs like prostatitis, cystitis, and so on, as well as seeing pelvic insufficiency fractures. One last thing that came up was, do we see these prostate radiation side effects with all the different types of radiation? This will actually be a quick throwback to part one, in which we learned that patients with prostate cancer can either get external beam radiation therapy or brachytherapy with a radioactive source placed at or in the tumor. Yeah, so in talking to our experts, it turns out that both external beam and brachytherapy can produce similar local side effects. Think about the cystitis and proctitis we just talked about. But because brachytherapy, the radiation stays closer to the tumor, brachytherapy is going to have a lower risk of affecting organs further away, like the bones. So that means patients getting brachytherapy are going to have lower risk of pelvic fractures than those getting external beam radiation. All right, why don't we finish out our episode on early and late side effects with brain radiation? Let's start off with the short-term side effects to look out for. The difficulty with the radiating in the brain is sometimes the radiation can cause inflammation, and that inflammation can trigger uh, some very specific side effects depending on exactly where the inflammation is. And so the brain is a little bit unique in that way that some of the side effects can manifest as really totally, um, you know, a wide range of neurologic symptoms. Um, it can even be a seizure. It can be difficulty with speech. So it, anything that just seems off could be from the radiation if it's a neurologic symptom. So that's a little bit different than most of the other sites. But those things are typically temporary. They get better with time. Wait, definitely not what I was expecting. To not expect such a wide range and even to hear about focal neurodeficits being a radiation side effect. What a plot twist. I know, right? Thing is, with focal neurodeficits, you're not really going to know whether those focal deficits are due to disease progression or if it's just post-radiation. And I think this is where we can loop in our radonks to weigh in on what could potentially be a radiation side effect. Long-term toxicity is memory impairment. Um, and that's usually difficulty with short-term memory. And so it can become more difficult for patients to remember where they put their keys or remember tasks that need to get done during the day. So we tell patients make a list or have a place where you need to put your keys and try to find ways to help them. And let's note here, the significant memory loss Dr. Spiegel is talking about is extremely common after whole brain radiation, with over 80% of patients experiencing some form of cognitive impairment. This is less common with SRS, but it still happens on the order of 30 to 40%. This difference, though, is because targeted radiation like SRS tends to have fewer side effects, as we talked about in episode one. All right, so let me summarize brain radiation side effects. So I was pretty surprised to hear, unlike most of the other sites of radiation and possible side effects, those are often diagnoses of exclusion. And it sounds like with radiation in the brain, it can lead to such a wide range of symptoms. And of course, it's a bit hard to know if it's from the radiation or if it's a disease progressing. And then unfortunately, it sounds like the long-term side effect with whole brain radiation is going to be cognitive impairment. And with that, that brings us to the end of our two-part series. That was quite the rundown. Yeah, definitely. And just to add, you know, we talked a lot about radiation side effects, but we do want to enforce that oftentimes radiation is safe and well tolerated in the majority of our patients. Thanks for joining us on this journey, everybody. Yeah. And Sam, thank you for leading us in this journey. I've learned a ton. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with your team, your colleagues, give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. It really does help people find us. 
tweet us, leave us a comment on our website, our Instagram, our Facebook page. Thank you to Dr. Sarah Stevens and Dr. Julian Hong for reviewing this episode. Thank you to Dr. Shapatia for the audio editing and Dr. Cabo Wang for the accompanying graphic. This episode was made as a part of the digital education track at BIDMC. A heartfelt thank you to all our great educators and mentors. As always, we love hearing feedback. Please email us at hello at coreimpodcast.com. Opinions expressed are our own and do not represent the opinions of any affiliated institution. Thank you. Take care. The new Super Beats Heart Chews Advanced is now supercharged with CoQ10. Support your healthy CoQ10 levels and blood pressure with two chews a day. Visit Radio Beats, B-E-E-T-S dot com and save 15% with promo code DEAL. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Corient. Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Corient has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Corient has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Corient has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com.